Uh, I'm your herald for this afternoon, and I have the pleasure and honor to introduce to you our first speaker of this afternoon. Um, one second. Her name is Plusea. Do I spell this correctly? Plusea. And Plusea is actually an e textile tailor. She's willing to share with us um, skills and all kinds of handicaps and uh, swearing that she actually, and time that she lost while doing her projects. Um, so give her a warm welcome, please. Plusea will really bring us this news. Hello, and thank you. Yeah, thank you to the CCC camp for this opportunity to speak about my work. Um, before I introduce myself, I think I'd actually like to introduce the materials that I work with, the e-textiles. Um, so what is e-textiles? Who here has heard the word before? If you could raise your hand. Nice. Um, so e comes from electronic and textile. Uh, and the idea is to integrate electronic functionality into textile materiality. And in order to do that, one of the first starting points is you need to start with some kind of structures that both conduct electricity but can also be used to construct textile structures. So uh, something as simple as almost the equivalent to a wire, a conductive thread. But while wires tend to be made out of copper, which has not got so much tensile strength, um, conductive threads are often engineered um, so that you can sew them and weave them and knit them without getting kinks and them breaking. And one way that that's done is um, by uh, plating a synthetic fiber that's very strong and can be sewn with a thin layer of metals. So a lot of conductive uh, e-textile materials are metallic. Um, and these coatings on the threads they work better on smooth surfaces, so a lot of these are kind of synthetic materials. But another way to do it is to kind of almost spin the thread from a combination of like a real metal that's not so strong with a, a material that is so, again, sometimes synthetic fibers or um, in the images we just saw um, some close-ups of a stainless steel fiber that's mixed with uh, wool and then spun to make threads that are sewable, knittable. And then once you have this thread, you can work it into fabrics. Um, sometimes uh, fabrics are first produced, woven or knit, and then coated, but sometimes these are woven or knit from these conductive threads themselves. Um, sometimes these fabrics are stretchy, sometimes they're not. Sometimes when they're stretchy, you can actually sense changes um, in stretch um, through the changes in resistance that happen in the material. And some of these materials are also have piezo-resistive effects, meaning that you can squeeze or squish them between two electrodes and again measure a change in resistance and be able to translate that into building sensors. And so while I just mentioned the kind of metallic coatings and fibers in the threads for often highly conductive materials, there's another technique of coating or polymerizing uh, materials with inherently conductive polymers. Um, and here's some images, and these tend to be black. So this is a um, power mesh fabric that's been polymerized, and when you stretch it, you see uh, the polymerization works on parts of the material that are black, but these uh, white threads that are probably an elastan, too smooth for the polymerization to hold, um, so they, they stay white. So these are the materials that I spend a lot of my time working with. And often, even I, when I was new to the field, thought that these were all these new things that were being developed. Uh, but when, over time, I started to realize that this combination of metallic metal and um, textile work is not so new. Not, it wasn't traditionally done for electronic purposes, but for decorative means. 
And even one of the main manufacturers of a conductive thread that we use a lot and that's also been ordered for camp for the wristbands to, if you want to embed some textile electronics with them, is a German company called Carl Grimm. And they even started making what they called Leonische Gespinste in the late 1800s. And they're continuing uh, this industry of e-textile production. Um, and I wanted to just mention two projects that are starting to, that are look, taking a look at this kind of history of electronics um, and textiles. And one is Stitching Worlds by Irene Posch and Ebru Kurbach. It's a really nice publication that came out with it. And they uh, produced an embroidered computer. Um, but they also looked into a bit of who is making the, these materials that they're working with, what were they made for previously. And another uh, work that also came out as uh, uh, is a book recently by Daniela Rosner called Critical Fabulations, where she looks at the what were known as the little old ladies, uh, LOL weavers, who wove the core memory for the Apollo space mission. And core, so this was a process of weaving uh, wires through magnetized uh, beads. So if you wanted to program a program that was going to run on this uh, space mission, it would be kind of hard-coded into this woven structure. And so this idea of textiles and electronics, these textile techniques and electrical circuitry coming together is yeah, not so new. So um, those were the materials and a bit about their past. Um, a bit about myself. My name is Hannah Perna wilson and I've been kind of maybe becoming an e-textile tailor for the past 13 years. And in this time, I've also collaborated a lot with Mika Satomi. And a lot of the work that I'm going to show in the presentation was done together with her under the name Kobakant. So as an e-textile tailor, you spend a lot of your time um, embroidering circuits. Um, this is a speaker coil that I'm couching down onto a piece of fabric. And I think what got me into e-textiles was I was not so much interested in technology. I studied industrial design. And I happened to take a course on sensor technologies. And the instructor, Laurent Mignonon, showed us how we could assemble our own pressure sensors by layering aluminum foil electrodes uh, with a piece of velostat in between. And this moment of realization that I could actually, I was understanding what was happening, uh, that we were able to make like a force sensing resistor, and that I could customize these kind of interface elements and that I could make them out of less common materials. And I could use knowledge that I had from growing up working with, with textiles to make my own electronic components and circuitry. And as I was preparing this talk, I started to think um, about what it means to be an e-textile tailor. Um, and before I talked quite a bit about the properties of the materials that they can conduct and resist and they have tensile strength. And I was thinking, what are these, what would be the properties that I would say now that an e-textile tailor should have? And I think one um, property that's good to have if you want to work with e-textiles is that you should also be conductive. Um, and I guess on the one hand, I do mean to be electrically conductive. And it's quite um, interesting, actually. And I think we don't think about it enough, but our bodies also conduct electricity. And we've got water inside ourselves and salt. And the reason we can handle a lot of these things with our bodies is because we have this really nice layer of resistive skin. So these three to five volt um, electronic circuits that I work with, if I didn't have the skin to protect my innards, they would actually be quite dangerous currents. But I also think it's good to be conductive to ideas and to be curious about how things work if you want to be an e-textile tailor. 
And then another, so I thought of three things, and the one was you should be conductive, and then the other one was that I think you should be a bit romantic. If you want to work with e-textiles and spend so much time in the studio working with materials, and maybe you shouldn't take yourself too seriously. Um, so to be romantic and conductive, and then also to be critical, and to be aware of maybe why you're able to do what you do. So for me, my experiences in this field have been very much ones of like creative expression and empowerment because I could do things myself, but I also realized that a lot of the things that I use in my practice are made by people um, who are not so lucky. The whole electronics industry and is built up on some of this exploitation of labor and things. So, what I would like to do now is to talk about some of these projects that I've worked on over the last years. But before I do that, I want to see if I can get these to work. Good. So let's see. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> uh oh. It's going all the time. Okay. So, um, I was thinking maybe I would... Okay, I need to... Uh... Just these a bit, maybe. Okay. Okay. So, um, I'm going to talk about these, the last kind of 10, 13 years of my project work, a bit with an analogy of a romantic, not maybe not a romantic relationship, but just a, a relationship. So how did I meet these materials? I met them through my first project, which I worked on together with Mika. And so maybe actually kind of our, our gateway drug to e-textiles was massage. So we really wanted to get back massages. And maybe you know it, when you ask someone for a massage, they, they might say yes because they feel obliged, but then they'll massage for a few minutes and won't last very long. And we were observing, though, that gamers um, had no problem doing quite similar motions. Uh. Um, with their game controllers, sitting there for hours on end, uh, playing these games. So we thought it was a logical thing to combine the two. And we built uh, game controllers that require you to massage the back of somebody else. 
Uh, it's called Massage Me. Unfortunately, um, the video is very small, but you can see them in action. Uh, we hacked a PlayStation 1 uh, controllers, and so we knew that we wanted to have the game controls on the back of the person. So we also knew we didn't want to have anything hard, just the textile material there. And so that was the reason why we started looking into e-textiles and how we could solve the, the interface. And it worked out very well as a, as a game controller. People really were motivated to play the game and to massage people. But as receiving, as a recipient end of the massage, it was not the best massage ever. <laughs> And here you can see some, a bit of the insides of the Massage Me vests. And so, in the end, we, it was a pretty simple hack. We extended the buttons from the controller directly into the fabric. We didn't even know about conductive thread at the time, so we were still using wires going to these patches of conductive fabric. And... But in the process of making these jackets, we did discover a lot more other materials and possibilities. So these are some like textile sensors that we developed uh, following this Massage Me introduction. And this was maybe a phase in the relationship where you're kind of, um, you have a crush and everything's exciting and you try out a lot of different things. Um, so these are little demos of uh, like knit sensors that are knit with a stainless steel yarn um, or resistive pieces of fabric making our own touch pads. Um, some capacitive, ooh, too many sensors um, going on from more of these small like sensor explorations into making more kind of actual projects. Here I made a whole quilt with a lot of tilt sensors on it. So basically beads dangling, and when they touch uh, contacts, you can kind of sense the orientation. Um, similar to here in these, in these bracelets, or this is a kind of recent thing I actually made based on an old idea, was to uh, have a, like a pressure touch pad on your whole arm, so making it all out of stretchy materials, so you can have kind of like sleeve that senses you, you touching yourself. And down here on the left, a uh, data glove. So just being able to capture um, positions of your hand. Yeah, so this was like the fun phase of exploring and um, discovering all these possibilities and getting ideas and making projects. And yeah, what do you, what do, you do when you're often, you, you've met someone and uh, you're happy and you're in love, is you also want to tell other people about it. And so quite early on, we already started uh, publishing our work on a website that we called How to Get What You Want. And it's, we've continued using it over the years, and every time we work on a project, we often break it down into small things and post them here on this website. But we didn't want to just be interacting with the community online. Um, and Mika, in 2013, organized a first e-textile summer camp, which maybe is not too dissimilar from the camp here, with the idea that it brings together people practicing in the field to hang out, um, exchange ideas, share our skills. And as part of the e-textile summer camp, I started organizing a swatch book exchange where everyone could submit a design of their own, and you would make multiples of it, and you would come to camp and we would mount them into these swatch books so that everyone could go home and have actual physical samples of other people's work, which uh, when you're working with these materials, and if I look at other documentation online, just having video and imagery is not enough to convey a lot of the technique that goes into making these things. And there's a website that goes along with them, so everyone documents uh, on this website what they've contributed to the exchange. And so then kind of coming into this relationship at some point you need to 
you've gotten to know each other, um, the excitement is over, you need to also kind of make a living. And if you want to stay together for longer. So this is a project that I did as a, one of my first commissions to make an open source robot skin for an open source robot arm that looked like this. And the idea was to emulate human skin, but as a first step, we tried to just, similar to the sleeve I showed before in the video, but for the robot arm to construct out of layers of non-conductive and conductive fabrics, like a pressure matrix. So this was like the flesh layer that had rows of conductive threads sewn into it. Then there was a piezoresistive sock that went over. And then there was a skin layer with the columns. And so when you squeeze at the points uh, between the rows and columns, Rubbing my leg. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So in these videos, you see the robot arm, and yeah, what was just then very difficult was to distinguish between the arm itself moving or the arm touching an external object. Um, so on the left, you see the arm twitching a little bit, and on the right, you see me handling it, and then on the back, you see a bit of a, a pressure map um, of, the, of the skin itself. But yeah, so this was a, a project that I did as a commission for someone else, and that's also been a part of my practice, to realize things for other people in exchange for money so that I can sustain other things that don't make money. Um, yeah, and then we were quite deep into working with e-textiles, and I think it kind of came that we started thinking about what tools would make this working with the materials more, more fluid, more natural, rather than knitting something, getting out your multimeter, clipping it on, measuring the resistance. What if you could actually measure that resistance while you were knitting, or in this case, crocheting? So this is a handle that I built for my crochet hook, where the metal of the hook works as one electrode, and this is the handle, and at the end, other end of the handle is a little, uh, like a pad that I can clip on with an alligator clip, and then I have these two probes, and I can crochet, and uh, it has a little display on it to tell me the resistance reading that I have, and then it has a little thumb, thumb potentiometer so I can adjust the voltage divider that I'm building together with the resistive material to get different sensitivities. So that was one tool. Um, another tool that we built came because we noticed we were working quite a lot with optic fiber and shining LEDs into this optic fiber to illuminate it and uh, make different projects. And every time we made a project like this, we ended up coming with some other weird custom solution for mounting that LED directly at the end of the optic fiber. So we, th we some point sat down and said, let's, let's come up with a more like, solution that we could use over and over again. And the best solution we could come up with uh, were these kind of bumblebee-like connectors. Um, so we were using addressable LEDs, so you have the in uh, ground, data in, data out, and we actually kind of mounted this, we broke out the circuit from the LED and mounted it around the tube that you can then also like couple to the optic fiber. And while it was such a nice solution, they were so elaborate to make. It took maybe 10 minutes to make one of these. Um, so we started thinking about how we could edit the design and make it something more mass manufacturable. Um, and this was one of the first prototypes that led to an idea that using kind of traditional PCB manufacturing technique, but what if uh, we actually the, manufactured the PCB from the side? Uh, kind of went back again. No. 
So we kind of manufacture it from the side and then we kind of flip the PCB back up again and we get these nice valleys that we can like sew into with the conductive threads. And so it took me a while to learn KiCad and translate that idea into something I could send off for. And then last year we got the first batch of them. And it was surprising, the first batch had no mistakes and they worked. It's also very simple. It's just a breakout board, but some of the tolerances were quite small at some points. And so they work, and I actually have some with me. Um, if you would like to use some, and I also have some optic fiber, uh, one idea would be to do a bit of a workshop with the uh, wristbands that you get for camp. Use that as the controller to control some of these. We call them the Lulu board. And uh, make some light up elements on your band, wristband. So this was just a small demo to show. And it's also nice if you shine from either end, you can mix colors in the fiber. OK, so coming back to this relationship analogy, we had gotten to the point where we were making some tools to kind of sustain our practice, to kind of work through like repetitive issues in the relationship. Um, it should be a video. Oh well, there was, um, th then I think, then came a point where we got a bit delusion disillusioned, uh, or it got a bit bumpy, the ride with e-textiles. We started um, becoming more aware of these things that we were designing in this kind of small scale DIY arts um, context were actually starting to make their ways out into the world and uh, wearable technology was becoming uh, something that was not so far off and futuristic, but uh, companies were looking to really manufacture and on a larger scale. Um, and we didn't see so much thought going into what's actually going to happen when these materials go out into the world um, without thinking yet about how, what, what effects they will have on the environment and what means we might have to maybe um, have more of a circular economy with them. And so in 2012, Mika and I, we um, commissioned ourselves to produce a fictional commission set in the future, uh, which was to make a mourning gown, and we called it the crying dress. And for us, it was a first, I think, project where we were thinking about this future of, the future of craftsmanship, but also the future of um, these materials making their way out into the world. Um, and I don't, at that time, we didn't know that um, six years later, we would actually open a tailor shop to kind of do more of a real enactment of this idea of what it could mean for technology be, to be custom made and handcrafted um, rather than something you buy in the shop. And so for the last, so 2017-18, uh, we really had a tailor shop in Berlin on the Görlitzer Park. Uh, it was uh, two big rooms. One was more a display and showroom where people could come in and see what's possible and what the materials are. And another room that was the workshop where we would work to realize these things that people did actually come in and order from us. Yeah. So this is a bit of what it was like in the workshop. We had a price list that was um, not based on any realistic exchange of um, value for what we made because we didn't want it to be about can I afford to have this, it was more about what idea can I even have an idea of something I would like to have? So we got funding actually to, to support um, our labor time in the, in the project and the price list was actually more of a token uh, to have this exchange and, and to maybe cover some of the materials that we used. And so in total we were open for a whole year 
And in that year, 14 people came to us and they had ideas for things that they wanted. And we realized them, and this is just uh, some of them. And of these 14 people, quite a few of them had um, wanted something that would light up or would sense uh, their body. And I wanted to go through one of the commissions in a bit more detail. And this is Boris. He's, uh, he plays posaune, trombone, in a, in a street music band. And in the band, they've started to add LED lights to their instruments and so on. And so when he walked by our shop, he made this connection and uh, decided that he would like to commission a costume for his, himself to wear in his marching band. So we started off making sketches of what should this costume be, what um, Anforderungen requirements are there in terms of like wearability and, and robustness. And in the end, we uh, decided on a kind of vest that's asymmetrical. And so from that decision based on the sketches, we start making a mock-up in what's called a toile, so a, like a, a cheap um, fabric that we can use to prototype. And parallel to that, we kind of prototype the electronics part, which in this part was going to be an LED strip. And we actually ended up making kind of basically our own NeoPixel strips where we could have custom spacing. Um, and then we could mount these strips in a kind of snake-like pattern so the LED light doesn't shine directly out but shines at, kind of sideways out from these little crevices. And at the time, someone had brought us an old, like a street worker sleeve off the street uh, made out of this orange material. And we decided to make as much of the vest as possible out of this sleeve to make it orange. And underneath the vest, he wears a corset with a little knit stretch sensor. So when he, breathe, when he breathes in, the vest lights up. And as he breathes out through playing the trombone, uh, the light diminishes. And so this was a, a fi almost final fitting with uh, Ben, who came in to help us with pattern making. Um, and we're fitting it on Boris. And then this was, if there's sound, you can hear him play as well. But yeah, he's playing the trombone. And you can see the lights light up and go off. If it's possible to get sound, I could turn it on, but otherwise. It's okay. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Um, okay, so now I presented quite a few projects. As if almost like me, this e textile tailor uses these materials to have ideas and to oops, put them out into the world. And I started to think or become a bit more aware though, like of what is actually happening in this process that's a bit, of, a bit of design, a bit of material science, a bit of electrical engineering. What is this relationship between me and the materials that I'm working with? And this kind of feeling started to turn more and more into an idea that maybe there is something more happening and it's just not just my ideas and me translating them into objects and putting them out into the world, but I think also the materials are trying to tell me something. And so earlier this year, I decided to break rule number eight, which says don't try to analyze and create at the same time. These are two different processes. And I embarked on a month long, kind of, I gave myself a month to explore a new material, thermochromic pigment, which is a pigment that changes color at a set temperature. And I, I just kind of explored it, mixing it with different other materials, applying it to materials, finding ways to heat it up. And while I was doing this exploration, I was taking a lot of notes and I was kept making samples of everything that I was making. And then at the end, I went back and I looked over everything and I, and I made this kind of stop motion animation that's almost like a time lapse of how these ideas and um, possibilities unfolded for me. 
And, and I think I recognized four things that I'd not really been aware about at all in all of my practice the last years. And that is that, first one was that I think I'm following the materials much more of the time than I think. It's when I sit down to work uh, with something new, I'm very much, if it's going to be a good process, I think I need to be good at listening to what the material, what properties it has, what is it good at. It's not, my idea doesn't just come from every, anywhere. It's coming out of this um, engagement with the material. And that's maybe the second thing is that these um, things I end up making are very much embedded or connected to the properties of these materials. And a third thing was that I'm really not very skilled at actually transitioning between this, thinking about things that I want to do and then actually making them. I spend a lot of time just sitting around um, kind of trying to make that jump back and forth between I have an idea and I want to try it and then actually trying it and then I'm trying things but I know, I need to, I know I'm trying to, uh, I'm coming up with ideas but then how to articulate these ideas. So, first thing was that I'm following the materials a lot of the time. Second one was that a lot of the stories that I tell are actually coming from the materials. A third thing was that I'm not very skilled at going back and forth between this abstract thinking and material making. And the fourth one was that I, I really started to appreciate this value of community in any kind of making process. Because when you go off just by yourself, coming up with things and making them, it can be very alluring. Like you, I find like I can get very lost in that process, and it can be very nice feeling. Like you just keep trying things out, and you get somewhere. But then at the end, you can also feel often very lost, and you need other people, or you want other people to tell you that what you're doing is making sense, or and to other people to see what you've done and, and uh, comment and and to have some kind of connection back to this reality in which you're embedded in. And so after noticing these four things, I started to think back over my projects. And one project started to stick out to me. And that was in 2016, I got to do a residency at Autodesk, has this big machine shop in San Francisco called Pier 9. And it's, uh, you get 24 hour access to all these kind of five axis mills and like laser cutters and 3D printers. And it's, it's kind of an impressive space to be allowed to work in. And they also offer courses to learn how to use all of the software to control the machines. And so, yeah, I spent time learning to 3D model and to generate tool paths for, for milling machines and using water jet cutters to I cast iron rods in resin and cut off small slices. Um, I 3D printed speaker coils with a conductive silver paste. I used the shop bot, which is a big CNC mill, to mill out rings with holes in them and then sewed them together with rope. Um, but all this time that I was working with these machines, I. I, I noticed myself um, really missing this more hands-on encounter with the materials, working with my hands. And in the sewing space at Pier 9, there's like a, it's a nice sewing table. And on the sewing table, there's a box with just straight tailor's pins. So something like this. And I, and I would just started playing with these pins and I would poke them through materials. This is uh, from the encyclopedia, uh, Adam Smith, who analyzed the kind of process of the division of labor, took the pin factory as actually the example upon which to base his analysis. And so I was starting to look at these pins as these very like minimalistic, but also very beautiful representations of, of what a tool is. So, 
a pin has like one end that is sharp, it's intended for the material, and it has another end um, that's not sharp, that's intended for the maker. And, and all these other tools I was working with, even though maybe I was sitting on a computer uh, using more complex software to control an end mill milling into some wood, it was, could kind of be nicely represented by this pin thought. And so these are some of these pin explorations of poking pins through different materials, using, starting to use the pin as a material and not only as a tool. No, okay. I have to hurry up a bit too, my time is running, running low. But now I have to click through all of them. I even started thinking about, yeah, what happens if the pin flips around and points towards me and then I started um, coming up with this idea for like a dangerous skin that could be this 3D printed structure with pins in it that would all poke into you, to the body. Oh no! But then, um, something happened. And I was in the studio one morning, and I was, it was early, and I was in a rush, and I had this pincushion on my hand with my pins in it, and I just pulled off my sweater over this pincushion, and one of the pins went into my hand. <laughs> okay, so it stayed in my hand for quite some time because it took me a while to get an appointment to actually do the operation to take it out again. But this whole process really got me thinking about this, um, like what had happened there. Was it really that the pin had flipped and that it had gone the wrong way? Or was it more that me and maybe the pin had, had actually changed place and that I am also a material? So this whole separation between me talking about these materials as if they were something separate is not such a good way of speaking. Maybe this works. <laughs> so they did manage to cut the pin out, but um, I did go back and have more x-rays taken afterwards and it looks like actually the pin is still in there and it has started to multiply. <laughs> the end. So this last... <laughs> Great, Hannah, thank you for your fantastic, uh, uh, nice hands. Uh, let me see it, actually. Is it yes, oh, yeah, it's still there. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for a Q&A. Um, there are a couple of mics. One second here in the front. It's really it's still there. Huh? I can yep. see it. Yeah, I can. <laughs> Do you want to explain to us how the leggings work? Um, how do you think they work? I, I actually uh, don't <laughs> really fully have a clue, and, unless it's maybe a stretch sensor is in there okay. somehow. Yeah. No, it's a nice question. So when I was putting on the leggings you saw in the background, there was a video playing. That was actually the process of making the leggings, which was only two weeks ago that I made them. Um, I've been working with some friends to polymerize our own conductive fabrics. So this, everything that is black here on the fabric is uh, conductive but it has this property that when you squeeze it or you stretch it, it becomes more conductive. And we're still trying to figure out exactly why that is, if it's the conductive layers that are around the loops in the fabric being pulled taut, or it's actually a compression of that polymerized layer th through it being stretched or squeezed. Um, but what was really nice was to discover that this polymerization process worked perfectly to do things like tie-dye or batik. So traditional textile techniques where you create a resist on the fabric. So in this case, I was wrapping it up and I made little marbles in it. And everywhere where the string is, it didn't manage to polymerize. 
And so underneath these leggings, I'm wearing some very nice looking skin colored leggings where I've sewn conductive fabric in. And this is like the, the electrodes or the, the terminals where I'm measuring the change in resistance across, so behind my, my knees. All right. Someone else with a question? Yes. Thank you. That's fantastic, isn't it? Were you planning to do a workshop, you said? Uh, you mentioned something like that. Yes, so together with uh, Julian, actually, um, in the... What's the name of the... So the, the, badge, uh, the badge tent. So uh, there will be a workshop uh, with how when? to sew. Um, we don't know yet. We will announce, but it, on we will announce it on Twitter and Mastodon on over the uh, badge uh, account. Okay. And there will be uh, at least one workshop on uh, sewing conductive thread into the wristband of the badge and, and attaching it to the badge and doing nice stuff. Okay, super. I see a question at that side, isn't it? No. Someone else with a question? Are there in the audience out? Yeah. Um, Yes. Over here, to the left. Here. Um, oh, there is someone. Sorry, uh, yeah. Do you have any e-textile clothing that you're wearing in your everyday life? That's a good question, and I think this is one a first step. In um, short answer would be no. <laughs> so it's more like an arts project. But it's not because I don't want it to be. It's more okay. that I struggle to come up with things that I need in my life okay. and that I could make and then also to find the time to make them well enough that they don't break. So I've quite often quickly made myself bike lights um, to, to wear, but they've not lasted for yeah. long enough. All right, thank you. Okay, there was one question on the internet there. Hi. Uh, yes. Um, do you think that um, wear wearable uh, like electronics will always be have to be made for one person in mind, or do you think it will be scalable enough that like one piece of clothing can be used by different people? I definitely think it's scalable. Um, I think more my interest in this tailor-made, customized version of it is because I already see industry doing the mass production. Um, trying to figure it out to make something that a lot of people can wear, but I don't see so much happening on the other end of custom-made stuff. So we wanted to explore this idea of if, if there was a tailor shop like the Koba on your street, do you even have an idea for something yourself that you don't go to MediaMark to buy, but you actually have to also have that idea? Of course. Thank you for sharing your ideas and your experiences with us. Um, for the last time, guys, Oh, there is another question. One last question. Okay, one last one. Please hurry up. So, oh, one but last. You step. mentioned the future of the individual garments, and that gets me wondering, what's the state of the art for um, doing e-textiles that don't just become toxic e-waste when people are done with them? Are you exploring that, or do you know of anyone who is? Um, very nice question. I think it's bound up in a more the same discussion with the whole fashion textile industry itself, looking at how, how things that people buy that are textile, and also e-waste and electronics waste, and yeah, making the, the producers more responsible for the things that they put out into the world, um, that, yeah, that they make things more, more fixable, that they're also willing to fix them themselves. Um, I think, I think the solutions I've heard of that seem most uh, good to me go along these lines of not just thinking of like, okay, how can we make it separatable afterwards and, and recyclable, but actually also that the product itself has a longer life, that we, that we get away also from this idea of buying something and not using it for so long. But the things that you have, you, you use for longer and maybe you can fix them yourselves and... Let's hope so, yes. One last question, I'll give you my mind. Uh, do you also have some clothes for um, surveillance, defending uh, for the face, for example? Um, I don't, but 
could be it could be very interesting to in, in general masks are for surveillance like a mask is a wearable for the face and then that almost in itself is a so I have made some masks for not for necessarily just for surveillance purposes anti-surveillance purposes but um, can I add to that because I'm also part of the program committee there's a talk by Adam Harvey on Friday about exactly that topic so you want to check that out for exactly that uh, sort of topic for surveillance circumvention via uh, facial uh, modification. Great. Guys, um, give a warm applause again to uh, Pusea and to you. Great. <laughs> And, uh, well, check out Mastodon or Twitter for the workshop, though, to be announced. I'm looking forward. Mm -hmm. I will see you there as well. Thank you. Thanks, guys.